Hello everybody and welcome to the ViBSD YouTube channel. In this series we will be looking at Bive, which is the FreeBSD hypervisor. Uh, this is part two. Uh, in part one we uh, looked at the system setup, which uh, included things like setting the right system CTLs and loading the right modules. Um, also included how to automatically start um, any service basically on boot without having to write an rc.d script or service script service whichever anyhow uh, assuming that you've uh, trudged your way through that or you're already fairly familiar with freebsd and vive uh, we're going to uh, get along i'm just logging into my system now and we're going to require tmux for this one and give me a nice red prompt for danger lovely not sure there we go. So we are going to head into our VN init folder, which is where we're going to keep all of the scripts that we'll use for starting our various virtual machines. Now, as I obviously knew I was going to do this video, um, I already created one that is suitable for Windows, which is here. Now, I have actually made, I've actually added this script into the GitHub repo that's linked in the description so if you want to grab that and edit it to your heart's desire no problem there um, also all these sysctls and other other files are actually in that git just to um, help you along it was really to do with part one but yeah anyhow so here we have windows server 2016 now the actual name of this file in my system is actually quite important because the name of the file will determine the actual name of the virtual machine so here we're calling it Windows Server 2016, which is what the what Bive will name this container. Now, if we open it inside, we've got hashbang bin shell, basically specifying that this is a born shell. Uh, nothing special there. And here we're setting some variables. So bridge equals bridge three. Um, I the best way to think of a bridge um, when dealing with Vibe, with Bive is a bridge is a virtual network. Um, on my system, especially this one, I have bridge 3 configured in this fashion. So basically the host is 3.200.2.1 and it's a slash 24 or a, or a net mask of 255.255.255.0. So it's basically a standard LAN that is attached to bridge 3 or is accessible via bridge 3. Now, VM name, base name, dollar O. Um, this is what I was mentioning just before. Um, the script name was Windows Server 2016, and this will basically set that value in VM name. Um, yep. Uh, okay, so next we've got tap dev. Uh, we are setting tap dev to if config tap create. Now, this command actually creates a tap device and numbers it automatically. So if we type it over here, we create tap zero because that was the first one available. And another one, and we've got tap one. If we did it again, we'd get tap two and such and so forth. Now, we don't actually want those devices because they won't be connected to anything. So we'll just remove them now just to keep everything nice and tidy. Even if we actually can type them right. There we go. Now, uh, the final uh, in this little block is if config dollar bridge addm tap dev. Now, what this basically says is add the tap we just created to the bridge that we specified above. Addm stands for add member. Now, the other way to think about this is add the virtual network card to the virtual network. If you prefer thinking about it that way, there's no problem doing that. So yes, anyway, add our network device to our bridge or to our virtual network. The next two commands may actually not be required. Um, we set some, we set a sysctl that basically marks tap devices automatically up when they are connected to, which is not the default behavior on FreeBSD. Um, so these likely do not really matter, but they don't, even if the actual devices are already marked up, marking them up again has no effect on them whatsoever, so it's just handy just to have them here. Um, just an echo saying what VM name we're starting. And then the Bive block. Oh, I'll take a drink for this one. Okay. Minus C is cores. Um, what this basically says is, for this VM, I want you to use four cores from the host. 
This is an eight core machine, so four cores seems reasonable. Uh, I tend to never actually set the same amount of cores as what the host has. I always have it at least one lower. That way, if one of the VMs gets stuck in some horrible fork bomb, it won't put a lot of load on the parent, and you'll still be able to log in and kill it, or whatever you like. M, 4 gig. Now, this actually specifies the memory in the um, virtual in the uh, virtual machine. I've lost my words then. Um, M, 4 gig means 4 gigabytes, as expected. You could change this for M to have 4 meg, or you could even change it to T to have 4 terabytes. Or you could change it to have six gigabytes but we're going to use four gigabytes for this example w and h i'm not going to cover in tremendous detail because they're just one of those things that are just there um, you can look these up in man Bive if you want but just for general purposes i think all of my vms actually have both of these there's no real reason to not do and um, the same is true of host bridge um, it's one of those things that you really don't really need to mess around with that much and just leave it's, it just leave it there on point zero now the device the devices that are plugged into our virtual machine uh, in position one or slot one we've got a hard drive which is pointing to a ZFS Zvol now this does not actually exist yet and we've basically used VM name to actually determine what it's going to be called. Now, the reason we've done this is that if you're creating lots of these virtual machines and you want to just easily make them, uh, because VM name is actually set from the script we used, which was Windows Serve 2006, it's a nice, easy way to name them. Um, something interesting about this line in relation to Windows specifically, uh, as you probably know, vert IO devices or para virtualized devices are actually a lot more efficient. And the power virtualized hard drive, which you'd use for FreeBSD, OpenBSD, Linux, and pretty much everything else, is Vert IO BLK or Virtual IO Block. Now, Windows does not have the Vert IO drivers built into it, so you cannot do this. So you have to use the traditional AHCA, AHCI HD. And we'll also need to create the ZVOL. So we'll swap terminals to over here, and we'll create a 20 gig. VDEV there. Now ZFS create is obvious, uh, minus that's a capital V and 20G, which means create a VDEV, which is a raw block device. This is not a normal petition um, in the location we've just specified. Base, VN, VMS, Windows Server 2016, like so. And we can actually verify that it's done that by copying the path from here. Dev, ZVOL, base, VN, VMS. And in here, we should have Windows Server 2016 and freebsd.dev.net. Uh, freebsd.dev.net was another VM that I set up that was running FreeBSD that I have basically forgotten to remove. <laughs> Lovely. Um, right, so moving on down. Uh, in slot 3, we have an a, a optical drive, a HCI CD. Um, despite the fact that this says CD on it, this can be a DVD image as well, and I, I, I imagine Blu-ray would work as well, but I'm not sure. Um, so yes, just a HCI CD means optical drive, not of any particular kind. Um, the actual path we've given is the path to the Windows ISO, uh, Windows 2016 Server Molly, and we can verify that's there using LS on the other terminal. Note how I've used VN media because we're keeping all of our virtualized virtual stuff all in the same VN structure. Now, out of these files, DC is the data center version and 2016 is the desktop version. Um, I went for the desktop version because it's well, a lot heavier just to prove that it does work. So yes, um, there is our installation media. Um, in slot 4, we've got another CD-ROM drive with Vert IO drivers. And from what I said earlier, I'm sure you can probably guess what this is for. Now, because we want the most performance we possibly can, we really want to use um, as many Vert IO devices as we can. Uh, I mean, we can't do anything about the hard drive because we can't install the drivers onto an operating system that's not installed on the drive yet. So it has to be just as it is. Um, so yes, we've added another CD with an ISO of the drives on this file the IO drivers is in the github repo in the description as well um, So you can easily add it to your Windows VMs as well and um, 
get to the next line working, which is this. Slot 6, vert.io-net. Um, now, the same as the hard drive, we could actually have emulated an Intel 1000, E1000 network card here, which would have just worked. There'd have been no need for drivers, uh, because the E1000 works on pretty much everything. Uh, but we want more performance. So what we would use, we're going to use a Vertio network card, which it, Windows is going to go, I don't know what to do with this. Um, and then we are going to use the Vertio driver ISO to install the relevant drivers for it, so we can get a reasonably high performance network card in our virtual machine. There's the main block. Now on to the rest. Um, slot 29, FBuff, which actually stands for frame buffer, I believe. Uh, TCP equals 0000, zero, zero, zero colon 45555. Five, five, five. Now, this starts a VNC server on basically every IP it can find on the host system. 0000, zero, zero, zero means bind everything. You could actually put a specific IP address here. Um, if, you, for instance, you had a LAN connected to this machine, you could just um, share it to the LAN, which obviously is a little bit safer. Um, I've used a firewall outside of this environment, so I'm quite safe and quite happy with that. But And we can also remove this uh, VNC line after the installation is done. But as it's Windows, we need a VNC server to actually step through the installation steps. Um, obviously, 45555 is the port it's going to run on. And W and H are the width and height, 640 by 480. I actually do not know if this install is going to work with that lower resolution, but we're going to find out. Uh, the final argument in this line is wait. Now, when you start this script, it will basically start BIVE, load up the instance, and then stop. And what will happen is BIVE will wait for you to connect with VNC to this instance uh, so you can continue along with the installation. Uh, and the reason that's particularly important, especially for Windows clients, is that when this boots, it will find the CD-ROM and it will ask you, do you want to boot from the CD-ROM? And it does that quite quickly. In fact, it's very easy to miss. So it's quite nice that we can get BIVE to wait for us to connect. Uh, the final one, uh, not the final one, uh, the next one down is XHCI tablet, uh, which basically means pointing device or drawing tablet, or it's the mouse. <laughs> it's a simple one, uh, just so we can use a mouse in the VNC. Um, LPC is the same as host bridge, and I'm not 100% sure what it's for, so I do need to check that out, but it's one of those things that appears to be in every VM, um, every VM script. LCOM1 STDIO. This one's a little more interesting. Um, for FreeBSD and Linux, um, at least most of the Linuxes, I think, if you wanted to run without the frame buffer and still step through the install and you had this line, after you run this script, you will basically be logged into the virtual machine over its um, serial port, over a COM connection. Um, the reason FreeBSD and Linux and probably OpenBSD do this is because they're often installed on machines that do not have graphics cards. Um, for the sake of a Windows machine, I really probably don't need this, but it does actually create um, an interesting thing, at least when installing Windows Server, that I just want to show you. Um, I'm pretty sure that you can't install it through Windows, but maybe I'm wrong. Someone may correct me on that. Uh, but yes, that's a local virtual com to the VM. Um, LBootROM. This is simply the path to the UEFI firmware. Um, in most cases nowadays, uh, especially for modern Linuxes, Windows, and anything else, if you can absolutely help it, you want to use the UEFI loader because it makes things so much easier. Um, when you want to start new Linux, new alliances, for instance, you can actually get around not using the grub loader and just use the UEFI loader instead, which is so much tidier, so much neater, so much easier. Um, this actually is in a, a separate port and package, so you may need to install it before you begin. Um, in fact, I should actually find that now. So if I go package search UEFI and grep for BIVE, there they are. And that's the one you want to need, UEFI EDK BIVE. So continuing along, dollar VM name is the name of the VM, which of course is the same as the script. Now, when that BIVE command runs, it will basically um, steal the console and 
it'll uh, basically connect it to COM1 on the system. Uh, when you restart or shut down the BIOS instance, um, this command BIOS C4 and the rest of it will exit, and then it'll go to the next line here, which is BIOS CTL destroy VM VM name. Now, this is very important to run after any BIOS instance because it's possible that BIOS could have left an instance in dev VMM, which means that if you then try to start the same virtual machine again with the same name, it will say, sorry, I can't, it's in use. So yes, important, remember to uh, clean up your VM after you are done with it. Uh, the remaining two commands, if config dollar bridge delete m tap dev, this is the opposite to the add m at the start of the, uh, start of the script and basically removes the tap device from the virtual network or from the bridge, whichever you prefer. And the final line, tap dev destroy, obviously just removes the tap device entirely. Obviously we do not want to remove the bridge because we might have other VMs that are wanting to use it. So with that said, we should now be ready to boot us some Windows. So we are going to set the Windows server script as plus X in case we ever want to start it from somewhere else easily. And we are going to fire her up. Now, this has actually stopped. It's just started the Windows server and frame buffer and it's just waiting for me to connect. So I'm going to connect like so. And hopefully I was fast enough. I wasn't fast enough. This is what I was mentioning about how it asks you to boot from CD. So we are going to have to do a little trick. Well, I say a little trick. Kill Bive and be faster. <laughs> Please be fast enough. Yes, that looks like we got it. Aha, and here is the magic Windows system shell thing that I'm unsure what it is, um, called SAC. If anyone has any idea what that is, um, please feel free to comment because I have no clue. Uh, and as you can see, we're slowly loading into the Windows installer. Very slowly. Internet connection is getting a trial today. For those of you who are wondering or who have the same issue with the VNC actually connecting too slowly and then it actually fails the boot, um, I actually just tapped enter the moment I connect, the moment after I connected, and it just catches it in time. It is a very, very short question for how. Um, if you want to actually load the CD or not. Do do. Just because I'm curious, I'm going to actually type, type help in this sack thing and see what happens. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> so here we are. Uh, and what version do we want to install? Um, standard desktop experience, I guess. Okay. At least I think that's right. And I accept these terms.
If anyone has any other ideas for any other installations they would like to see, feel free to add them to the mailing list or um, simply comment on the descriptions in here and I'm sure I'll get them. Uh, I'm just going to click next and I believe Windows will automatically petition and format that all for me. This is going to be a very long install, I might actually have to speed this up. <laughs> Do, do, do. Let's see how fast it will copy. What the heck is that sack thing? It must be for actually configuring the network in the background, perhaps. Where's the IP numbers? Toggle diffs. Yes. Yeah, I think I'm just going to speed it, speed this up. <laughs> do, 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 do. Mm -hmm. It is a little faster than I thought. Do a little bit of cleaning while I'm here. Uh, is there anything else I could show you? I know what I could uh, show you while we're waiting for Windows to install at the speed of epic slow. Um, in the scripts directory in the GitHub I um, have popped there, we have an install.freebsd example.net, this one. And I'm on FreeBSD, not Linux, so of course no, it didn't work. There we go. Um, and this is actually what you'd require to install a FreeBSD system. Uh, you might notice that you've got the addition of Bive Loader, uh, which is actually the bootloader, which is almost like Grub for Linux, um, that basically uh, loads the required files into memory so that the actual kernel and the rest of the system can be loaded. Um, also, uh, this one, obviously, like I was saying, uses vert.io blk for the hard drive. And we've got HAMP for this one. I believe A is something to do with ACPI. Um, ACPI configuration um, H is there I think the minus W is literally a developer thing and probably shouldn't actually be in the Windows config in fact why don't we remove that no point really um, having additional flags you don't need um, but after you've actually run the install like this um, and you've uh, stepped through and installed whatever you need, you can then swap over to this, which is actually the um, running config for FreeBSD. And the actual difference is with the um, BIV load, because if you grep for BIV load between these two, you get nothing because I must have spelled something wrong. There we go. Ah, here we go. Um, you'll notice that one of them has the actual path to the ISO, which is um, the installation ISO, and the other one has the path to the um, ZVOL, uh, the VDEV. Um, and the reason for that is that Bivloader will take basically a path to what it's going to boot. So to actually install FreeBSD, you need to tell it that it needs to use the ISO, and to actually run the thing that you've actually installed, you need to give it the path to what you installed to, which is a little weird but <laughs> it does work and I think our windows is nearly cooked 
It's not going to be installing any updates because that network card is not installed yet. And I'll just show off those SysCTLs as well while I'm here. Come on. I'm going to have to... It always seems much, much slow when you've also got a camera pointed at you. Hey, there we go. Progress. Don't wait, restart now. Um, and just to actually to show that script, um, that will now not exist at all. And I need to be in the right terminal. Here we go. I have no idea why it messes up the terminal so much. Um, if we look in if config for tab zero, it won't exist because our Windows Server script destroyed it after it was done. Now, when I run this this time, it should all be well because I don't have to actually press the um, key to actually start it this time because we want it to boot from the hard drive. So we'll do that and we'll fire up VNC again. And why not? We'll move over this side so you can get the full um, glory of that very, very, very unusual sack console that no one really knows what it does. Perhaps I should have gave it some more RAM. <laughs> Yes, I'm definitely going to have to actually do some video editing. I was actually hoping to do the entire series without um, actually editing anything and just, you know, doing everything real time. Uh, then again, maybe you guys prefer that. I mean, it's not hard to skip forward on a YouTube video. Who knows? Or maybe you enjoyed me um, going through the little um, FreeBSD installer script in uh, here. I wonder why RC local is red. Ah, because it's executable. Okay. Um, I recently actually found out that for rc.local, you do not need a path at the top of it, and you also do not need it marked executable. So we'll just update that while we're waiting for Windows to do whatever the heck it's doing. It's interesting that it's applying updates, but it hasn't actually got an internet connection. Unless they are bundled with it, I suppose. Oh, oh no, it was busy rebooting. Surprise, surprise. Connection was gracefully closed. I bet it was. So we're starting up again. Just as a note, that wasn't actually a crash. It was um, just Windows doing, well, Windows things. If I actually have anyone watching this who's um, really good with PF, I'd appreciate some help, by the way. It's a demon on Freenode. For whatever reason, I cannot get bandwidth limitation working inbound to the network, even though I can get it working outbound. Haha, -ha, finally, we're there. Okay. Um, let's choose a super secure password. So secure that you type it wrong. And there we have it, a working Windows Server. Um, let's try logging in.
I am really surprised that that allowed me to do that in 640x480. But then again, I suppose it is a server model. I suppose it's used to running on things like this. <laughs> or not. Black screen. Oh no, here we go. So, as I was mentioning, the uh, network card obviously is not showing up. Um, we'll wait for server manager to pop up and then just close it. And all that we need to do is go into device manager, which is here. And Ethernet controller there with an exclamation point. Everything else seems to have been detected fine. So we'll just update the driver software. Uh, browse my computer. Browse. What? Where's the browse dialog? Okay, let's try that again. Browse and browse. Thank you. And pop down here a little. And here we go. Um, now, the two um, CDs that are installed are also the ones that we had with our AHCDI CDs. Um, there's the Microsoft install CD and his Vert IO Win 0.11. And what we want is net KVM. And we want 2016. And if I click OK here and hit next, I'll get a warning saying, you know, this is made by a Linux vendor and it's evil and it's going to take over the world. So, yep, OK, I'll trust them. And there we go, Red Hat Vert IO Ethernet Adapter. Now, I have not configured DHCP, uh, DHCP, just for the simple reason that I presumed that most people wouldn't actually have it configured either, so I didn't want to go down that route. Um, if I move this over here, and I swap to my terminal, uh, what I can do is I can look on my bridge three and see that my IP is 322.1 for my host, so now what I'll do is, is I will simply go into here, open Network and Sharing Center, and click on the Ethernet button there. And grab this, and then I'll build through to Properties. I really wish I'd choose a higher resolution now. And Internet Protocol version 4, TCP IP and click properties do, do, do. and I'm sure all of you are used to setting the IP manually in Windows um, so we'll have 3.200.2.2 oh and 3.200.2.1 and 3. No. Yes, okay, thank you. Oh, God, I wish I was closer to this server. 3.200. I am actually not sure if I've configured DNS on that host so we'll just use Google's for now that's 8.8.8 .8 and 8.4.4 okay and I can't see the okay button on the dialogue Just get it there. Okay, yep, definitely use eight hundred by six hundred. 
because I can't reach the dialogue. <laughs> um, ah, hold on. I have an idea. If I move the taskbar over there. There we go. Do you want to allow your PCs to be discoverable? I do not. And close. And close again. Now, I believe that I actually have a network address translation set up on the host. But all that I need to do is prove that it will actually allow me to run things. And I can't see a way to actually start command prompt anywhere. So what I'll do is this. New shortcut. CMD. And now we should be able to get the traditional Windows CMD prompt. Wonderful, and let's try pinging the host gateway. This is the parent system, our FreeBSD system. And there it is. Now, whether or not I configured NAT or not is a different question. Let's try pinging Google. And obviously I did not. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to nip into PF and I am going to tell it, ah, here we go. NAT on XDIF and I also want bridge three network to also be natted. And now we should magically be online. Ta-da! So there we have a Windows server 2016 connected to the internet. Very, very easy. No problems at all. Um, I highly, highly, highly recommend using 800 by 600 rather than 640 by 480 because this is terrible. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and shut this down now. If I can actually reach the shutdown dialog, which will be so oh, the run dialog was in there as well. Of course it was. Send the signal or shut down. Shut down. Um, well, no, we're, we're, we've got a plan. We'll plan it. Okay. Uh, and I also want to show you Okay, now while I'm in here, uh, I'm just going to show you if config Bridge 3 again uh, And as you can see on the previous one tap 0 was connected Which was the Windows client and now nothing's connected. So our script has very very cleanly stopped um, the uh, Windows Server uh, very very cleanly tidied up after the Windows Server but because we now have a fully working Windows system what I am going to do is this which is not really part of the tutorial but it's always nice to just have um, on a working system and that's ZFS snapshot and I'll call it installed uh, okay we'll call it fresh install and now anytime that I want to go back to that particular point in that Windows server's life I can just restore that snapshot uh, run it from my uh, little script and off it will trot um, I hope this has been informative and thank you very much